Please turn in God's Word to Revelation chapter 1 for a reading from verses 9 to 20, a section we'll cover in three messages. I'm going to begin reading from verse 9. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet, saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamon and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man, clothed with a, loud, with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white like wool, as white as snow, his eyes were like a flame of fire, his feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the roar of many waters." In his right hand he held seven stars, from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died. And behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Let's briefly pray. Our Father in heaven, we come in dependence upon your spirit that we might understand this revelation uh, given by and about your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Brother, let me be your servant. Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I might have the grace to let you be my servant too. We are pilgrims on a journey. We are brothers on the road. We are here to help each other, walk the mile and bear the load. I will hold the Christ light for you in the nighttime of your fear. I will hold my hand out to you, speak the peace you long to hear. I will weep when you are weeping. When you laugh, I'll laugh with you. I will share your joy and sorrow till we've seen this journey through. When we sing to God in heaven, we shall find such harmony, born of all we've known together, of Christ's love and agony. Is that the spirit that Revelation is engendering in you? Is that what is stirred up as you read it, as you listen to these messages in the context of the church? It ought to be. Service, grace, peace, shared joy and suffering, togetherness as pilgrims progressing along the same road. It ought not to be a spirit of hostility towards those who disagree, but of gentleness and understanding. It ought not to be an intellectual arrogance in one's theological position, but rather a deep and abiding commitment to brothers and sisters in Christ. It ought not to be fear or conspiracy theories or panic. It ought to be faith and hope and love. After all, we're in this together, facing the onslaught of a hostile world together, sharing in the sufferings of Christ to some extent, even as we share in the hardships of a fallen creation, disease, sickness, recession, grief, disappointment, loss, heartache. So as I've said before, and as I will often reiterate, my intention is not to do battle with other Christians about this or that approach to eschatology. I will inevitably be at variance with some, yes, and I will seek to identify and correct error, speaking with conviction and passion, because the preaching is a place to do that, even as in other contexts one might adopt a less forceful tone. But preaching is declarative it announces with authority 
I just hope that even as I do this and as you hear it, none of us will ever come away thinking that the measure of Christian maturity is in how persuasively or forcefully we can argue our case. It's not. Rather, Christian maturity will be seen in our response, firstly, to God who gave this revelation, and secondly, and very revealingly, in our response to one another. Now, I have six points for these 12 verses, two for today, one for Good Friday morning, and three for Easter Sunday. The first is this, partnered in tribulation, kingdom, perseverance. Look at verse 9 there, where he says, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos and continues from there. John the Apostle, the last of the 12 disciples, is the human hand writing down this divinely given revelation. He has delayed introducing himself so far because first he had to tell his readers the nature of the book in verses 1 to 3, how they were to interpret it, this apocalypse. And then he brought the holy greeting of the Father, Son, and Spirit in verses 4 to 5, before breaking out into praise and doxology in verses 5 to 8. Now, though, he is ready to say who he is and where he was when he received this. He says he is their brother. He is one of them. He does not count himself above them. He had not forgotten them in his period of isolation, enforced quarantine, separation from the body on this island. The ties that bind them, their unity to Christ, their fellowship as part of the household, the family of God, the bonds of a Christian family are all very much in his mind now so more than ever, just as they should be in ours during our national lockdown. While our circumstances are not owing to persecution as his were, we still bear responsibility towards one another, and perhaps all the more as the full impact of the coronavirus is yet to be seen. At such time, we must remember we have dear brothers and sisters whom we must help and assist in trying times. Our kinship in Christ will be seen in our love, practical help, financial assistance, spiritual care. We will need one another, even as the apostle needed the church. And what he says next only underscores this. He says, I, John, your brother and partner. The word there, it, it literally means, it's a compound of two words, and it means together with sharer, or together with companion, or together with fellowship. Uh, he, he's a fellow partaker with them, fellowshipping with them in three important things. Look now. Tribulation, kingdom, patient endurance. What, what will be their common experience as Christians? What will be the experience of all Christians and all churches across all the history of the world? Tribulation, kingdom, patient endurance. And there's actually only one definite article here, not three, as uh, many English translations uh, suggest. It does not say the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance. It says the tribulation, kingdom, patient endurance, which commentators say is linking all three together as a single shared concept. You can't have one without the other. You will have them all if you are a Christian. So John says we are partners in the tribulation. And I do mean the tribulation. It's the same word used in Revelation 2, 9 and 10. I know your tribulation and you will have tribulation for 10 days. In Revelation seven fourteen, these are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. So the word tribulation is equated with the suffering of the church and not the suffering of the world. And some of you may already have deduced why this is important. It's because many of us grew up believing or were taught to believe that the church will never experience the tribulation. We've been told that the church will be taken out of the world, raptured before Tribulation begins. That the tribulation is something experienced by Israel and the world and not by us. 
And great effort has been taken, many books have been written, movies have been made to suggest that Christians will not be around when this happens. And let me say plainly to you that such an approach could only come out of a rich, comfortable, Western, first world approach to Christianity. Go to North Korea and ask them if they think that tribulation is yet to come. Go to the Middle East where Christians are beheaded and ask them. And if that seems too recent, go to any century in the last 2,000 years and read of the great tribulations of the church, of mob beatings and stonings and crushings and rape and enslavery, the confiscation of home and household goods, loss of liberty. Go read how Christians have been thrown to wild bulls, torn about by, apart by lions, tied to stakes and ravaged by packs of dogs. Hacked to pieces with swords, locked in steel containers in the desert, burned at the stake with fires purposefully stoked as slowly as possible with wet wood. Go read of families torn apart, fathers shot dead in the presence of their children like John Brown, daughters stretched out upon the rack like Anne Askew, elderly women like Margaret Lachlan tied to a stake in icy waters to drown, and of all the deliberately cruel tortures designed to maximize pain and delay death inflicted upon the church. And not one or two or ten or twenty or a thousand or two thousand or ten thousand or twenty thousand, but countless numbers, great multitudes across the centuries, and then sit down on the sofa with a cup of percolated coffee in the comfortable minority and tell yourself, the church won't go through the tribulation, the Lord will take us out before it begins. It is a cruel mockery of the immense intense suffering of our brothers and sisters in the church and the, the ignorance of Western Christians in this regard is staggering. What does John say here? I, your partner in the tribulation. He was already experiencing the tribulation. It is what defines this period of time between Christ's first and second comings. For those of you that may not be sure, did you know that the word tribulation is the same word elsewhere translated often as persecution or suffering in so much of the New Testament? John 16.33, in the world you will have tribulation. Acts 11.19, those who were scattered because of the tribulation. Acts 14.22, through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Romans 5.3, we rejoice in our tribulations knowing that tribulation produces endurance. 2 Corinthians 1 4, God comforts us in our tribulation so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any tribulation. Hebrews 10 33, you were sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and tribulations and sometimes being partners with those so treated. Each of those references speaks of the experience of first century Christians and every Christian in the history of the church. But somehow, in the last hundred or so years, a bad habit has begun in modern evangelicalism in the 20th and 21st century Christianity. Uh, the words persecution and tribulation were assigned different meanings. When some think of tribulation, they think of a future time before which or during which or after which Christ will take away the church. While when they think of persecution, they think of everything else. But the Bible uses the same word, not two different words that are then assigned different meanings by the theological position of the translator. And it says both here and elsewhere that Christians are already in the tribulation. Now, will it get more intense? Depends where you live in the world. Maybe, probably, I believe so. But it won't be some specially defined period from which Christians are exempt. Rather, it will be as a continuation of what has already begun in the early church. Tribulation, says the Bible, is, is what all Christians experience 
in the world, like John. I mean, look where he is. Patmos, Alcatraz, the Robben Island of the ancient world, situated 40 kilometers from the coast, uh, or, or from the coast of Ephesus, off the coast of Ephesus. It is a harsh Roman penal colony where enemies of the state were incarcerated for their refusal to comply with its laws. In this case, John's allegiance to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. This veritable, gentle, faithful old man. The apostle whom Jesus loved. The apostle entrusted with the care of Mary, the mother of Jesus, until her death. He is in tribulation. And that should be a warning to us. that No matter the sophistication of our times... No matter the protective measures of our constitution, which is open to change and reinterpretation, we are not exempt from suffering for the kingdom. All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, says Paul to Timothy. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you, says Peter. The hostility of the world stirred up by Satan to persecute and prosecute believers is an absolute given. And those treasured by Jesus Christ, like John, can expect to catch its eye. We will be partners in tribulation and in kingdom partners in the kingdom though we have no flag and have no defined geographical borders the church of jesus christ is made up of those in a very particular kingdom what does it mean to be partnered together in kingdom well it means for starters we are part of a corporate identity that transcends race, sex, age, politics, culture, nationality, or even personality. We do not find our identity or worth in those things, but as citizens of a common kingdom, finding our identity in Jesus Christ. It means we answer to a higher authority than any of the kingdoms of this world. It means we acknowledge the present reign of our king, the king, and live as those in the light of that reality. It means we are heirs to greater things. We already share some of the kingdom riches and rewards of Christ that he has promised us, one spirit, the blessing of fellowship and community, and much more, and yet we will also rule one day with him over a redeemed creation. We are aliens and strangers in the world, paupers, beggars and rags, yet kings and queens in waiting. And more than that, to be partner in the kingdom means the rule of Christ is already seen in and through us as we resist sin, say no to temptation, overcome the world, and proclaim the victory of Christ through the gospel. The rule of the world does not hold sway. We are not slaves to the world or slaves to sin. The world does not reign over us. And though the world may bring its, its to bear its totalitarian, totalitarian demands that we bow the knee to its kingdom, we belong to another. It's, it's why modern Luther wrote in that famous hymn of his, uh, mighty fortress is our God, he writes, And though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God hath willed his truth to triumph through us. Then let them take our lives, goods, children, husbands, wives, and carry all away. Theirs is the short-lived day, ours the lasting kingdom. Partners in the tribulation, kingdom, and patient endurance. A single word meaning patience in the Greek, but translated as two English words, because otherwise we might think of patience as just sitting back and passively waiting. The sense of the original, though, is both passive and active, a patience that is waiting, but also one that is enduring and persevering, as some have said, a stickability 
carrying on in the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ despite tribulation. And John is saying, I am in this with you. We are enduring together. We are fighting the same battles against sin, overcoming the same enemies, approaching the same throne under the same sovereign dom- domain of our King. We are united in these things which identify us as those loved, freed from our sins, and a kingdom priest to our God. And notice what it is that uh, incites the aggression of the world. Why it is that John is imprisoned on Patmos. It is because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. You see, the world is fine with the Bible as an ancient religious text to be lined up alongside other works from antiquity and studied in in academic institutions. But it will not tolerate the Bible as an authoritative revelation commanding instant and total obedience. The world is fine with a general belief in God, but it will not tolerate the exclusive claims of Jesus Christ. The world is happy for you to be a Christian, quietly, privately, alone, but it will frown and object and tribulate a Christianity that is vocal and public. Protection will be afforded to all other groups, all other viewpoints and convictions whom you dare not say a word against, but very often no such protection will be afforded to Christians as they blaspheme our Lord on television and mock our beliefs and heap scorn on our values. All manner of other ideas will be accepted, tolerated, embraced. All perversions and opinions and religions warmly and favorably depicted in the media. But the moment the name or claims of Jesus Christ are introduced with any degree of biblical faithfulness, there is the sudden, intense, targeted, focused, irrational, disproportionate, hateful opposition to what is said, a strong and immediate resistance that wants to silence that voice. I would almost say that it was strange how so much else is tolerated and championed while the word and testimony of Jesus Christ are hated. But it's not strange. It's normal. It's to be expected in a world of spiritual darkness. It's part of the tribulation of the church. Let's go to the second point then for this morning. Partnered and now prophetic in origin and content. Verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book. Verse 19, write therefore the things that you have seen, those that are, and those uh, that are to take place after this. The formula used here is straight out of the Old Testament. It's placing John squarely in the line of the prophets. So whatever he writes down now, we must understand as having the same origin and the same sort of content coming from God himself and concerning certain things. For starters, let's look at that phrase, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. The Lord's Day had become a way of saying Sunday, the church gathering together on the first day of the week and growing preference over the seventh day of the week, Saturday. But on this particular Sunday, something unique happened. John was in the Spirit. Now, this is not the ordinary experience of all Christians who worship in spirit and in truth. This is not the same as walking by the Spirit or life in the Spirit, such as Scripture elsewhere speaks about. This is not a description of some exceptionally moving experience, an emotional response to grand truth, such as we might legitimately have. This is not a surrender to feelings and impulse and imagination that is then wrongly attributed to the Spirit, like when Christians today say things like, Oh, I was asking the Lord for more of him and suddenly these pictures popped in my head of waves or clouds or pirate ships and I feel like the Lord is telling me this or telling me to tell you that. This this is not some vague, subjective, sensory, impossible to validate, open to wild interpretation 
impression. Now, this here of John's experience is the authentic and altogether unique experience of an apostle of Jesus Christ, a prophet, someone commissioned with a prophetic message to close the canon of Scripture. In other words, it's not going to happen to you. Don't expect it. Don't go looking for it. Don't believe it when others come knocking on your door to say they want to prophesy over your life. In fact, you know what I've said to people who come to me or call me and say they want to do that for me? I'm very polite. And then I sincerely inform them of their responsibility in light of their revelation. I say, thank you very much for thinking of me. I really appreciate it. And I do. But then I say, I'd like to give you the phone number of the Bible Society or Gideon's International, some other Christian publishers. You must call them at once and give them the good news that you have been entrusted with the 67th book of the Bible. If the Lord said these things to you, a book must surely be added to Scripture under your name. If you really have heard the word of the living God, you have a solemn responsibility to write it down and tell everybody. Do not delay. You know, not one of them has ever taken me up on that. You'd be amazed how their certainty evaporates at this point, And they're not quite ready to say they have heard the voice of God after all, which also demonstrates that you should never feel guilty for not bending your life to fit around their words. What does in the spirit mean here? It is the nature of true prophetic vision in the Bible to be in two realities at once, the reality of the physical world and the reality of the spiritual world, such as in Daniel 8 verse 2. And I saw in the vision, and when I saw, I was in Susa the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. Or Isaiah 6, 1, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. Or Ezekiel 1 verse 1, the beginning of his apocalyptic prophecy. And I was among the exiles by the Cheba Canal. As I was there, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Ezekiel 2 verse 2, and as he spoke to me, the Spirit entered me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. Acts 10 verse 10. Peter, hungry and wanting something to eat, but while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened. 2 Corinthians 12, 12 2-4. While rebuking those who claim to have visions, the apostle tells of how he was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, he does not know, God knows, caught up into paradise, and he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. In each case, the resultant prophecy, the resultant revelation borne out by the Spirit, was not the vague, nondescript, wishy-washy foam and froth that passes for so much of so-called modern-day prophecy. It was of far greater substance from an unquestionable source through a very carefully chosen and appointed individual, a prophet of Almighty God. And look at how this prophecy is introduced. And I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. That should remind us of something, shouldn't it? It's a very common introduction to great revelations or acts of God. Trumpets blasting, calling for attention, waking people up so they will hear. In this case, a voice like a trumpet arresting John and highlighting the importance of what comes next. It's what happened at Sinai, one of the greatest revelations in human history, the giving of the law. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. 
And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. Exodus 19. Leviticus 25, the year of the Jubilee, is initiated with a trumpet. It says you shall count seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that in the time of the seven weeks of years shall give you 49 years. Then you shall sound the loud trumpet on the tenth day of the seventh month. On the day of atonement you shall sound the trumpet throughout all your land. It's also very similar to Ezekiel 3.12. The Spirit lifted me up. And I heard behind me the voice of a great earthquake. The point is that it is loud and terrifying and irresistibly commands your attention. That's what John's facing here. And by the way, when taken together with the command that John write down what he sees... The presence of the trumpet makes it into a declaration of judgment and war as well. Because when God commands a prophet to write down something, that's often what comes next. Exodus 17 verse 9, the Lord said to Moses, write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. Isaiah 30, and now go, write it before them on a tablet and inscribe it in a book that it may be found for the time to come as a witness forever, for they are a rebellious people, lying children. Jeremiah 36, 2, take a scroll and write on it the words that I have spoken to you against Israel and Judah and all the nations. Isaiah 8, 1, Habakkuk 2, verse 2, even the law written on stone did not become a source of life to humanity, but an indictment against our sin. Hence Isaiah 58 verse 1, the trumpet announced God's verdict against sinful Israel. Cry aloud, do not hold back, lift up your voice like a trumpet, declare to my people their transgressions, the house of Jacob their sins. Joshua 6 verse 5, the trumpet blast announced the doom of Jericho. And when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, when you hear the sound of the trumpet, then all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat. Only now, in Revelation, it's not the city of Jericho that the Lord will come against. It's the city of Babylon. That is, the present world in all its godlessness and wickedness refusing to repent of its evil. And we'll also see, though, that he's speaking against the church that has compromised and failed to persevere to the very end, that has abandoned the path. So the prophetic calling of John and the description that follows in verses 12 to 16 gives a very plain warning. The warrior king, Jesus Christ, who is and was and is to come, will wage war against his enemies, even as the church endures through all the tribulation that, it can, that can be thrown against her. It is prophetic in origin and content. It is not like the bogus prophecies floating around today, always speaking peace, peace, prosperity, health, wealth, your best life now. It's not like that nonsense. And it's not about the trivial matters that some people make the, the subject of prophecy today. It is about rather the great and weighty subjects of biblical prophecy. That's what John was going to speak about. That's what he was going to receive and deliver to us. And then we see something of the actual content, more of the content here in verse 19. What was John going to write down? The things that you have seen. Those that are and those that are to take place. So aspects of this book were for John's present and aspects were for John's future, which again is the nature of true prophecy. It demands an ethical response in the here and now, the presence, and it points to an unalterable reality concerning the future. Present responsibilities, repent, love, serve, give, warn, proclaim, future inevitability, for the day of the Lord is coming. 
and a day of weeping and wailing for the world, but a, joy, a day of joy and everlasting peace for the church. Now, now, we have to be careful in the application of verse 19 here and not go beyond what the text is telling us, because some use verse 19 in a way that is both wrong and unnatural. They will say, the things that you have seen applies just to verses 9 to 18 of chapter 1, and that the things that are applies just to chapters 2 and 3, the latest of the seven churches, and that the things that are to come applies to everything from chapter 4 to 22. In other words, they push everything from chapter 4 onwards into John's distant future far beyond the early church. This verse 19, they say, is the grid that you lay over the entire book, dividing it into three easily separated parts, each with their own specific and exclusive emphasis. Now, what's the problem there? Why is that a bad way to approach that verse and the book of Revelation? And I'm going to spend a little time answering this because it will have a huge impact on how someone proceeds. If you think that everything from chapter 4 onwards is about the future, about a tiny span of years far, far, far away from almost every Christian that ever lived, then not only do you open the door for some radical interpretation, you are also likely to miss the immediate relevance and application of most of this book to believers in all the centuries. Instead, of 80, instead uh, you will make 80% of the book have little meaning uh, uh, and relevance and be totally beyond the understanding of just about every Christian that ever lived except those that happened to be alive moments before the second coming. Revelation would be intriguing still, perhaps, but otherwise it would not really have anything to do with us. What's more, if you say they are only about the future, then we could be no more certain of understanding Revelation now than any other Christian in the history of the church. Because how, how would we know when the future has actually arrived? What if chapters 4 to 19, in this framework of thought, what if those chapters are still 500 years away from fulfillment in the 26th century? How, how could you be sure? By looking at the news? Well, how's that worked out for the last 2,000 years? Not so well. No, we'd be sitting with these chapters left in eternal limbo, never quite sure if and when we are going to see its fulfillment in our lifetime. But is that the way to approach this book? A, B, C, past, present, future, neatly divided in three. No. There are some big problems here. To divide up that verse requires a strange handling of the text, a wooden and artificial application of a verse which John in no way himself assigns different chapters going forward. It simply doesn't fit. For starters, there is no reason to say that what John has seen applies only to the past to chapter 1. And there is every reason to say that it applies to the whole book. He is seeing all of this revelation. Remember, it's a picture book, not a puzzle book. It was delivered to John through visions, not words. He was watching it unfold, not listening to a recording. So you can't make what you have seen mean just verses 12 to 16 of, verse one, of chapter 1, when it plainly means the whole apocalypsis, the whole book, all of which is seen by John. Then, while the phrase, the things that are, certainly does refer to chapters 2 to 3 in the seven churches, absolutely. But we've already seen and will see again that they are representative of all the church, those seven churches, and that the things in this book are present in the first century. Yes, much of them, not all of them, present in the first century and present in every century. Much of it, but not all of it. But it's the last part that, that has become really uh, dangerous where people go overboard because a great deal of what takes place after this, that third part of that verse 19, was already happening in John's own time. In other words, it, it wasn't 
confined to thousands of years in the future from John. It was already happening and in every generation since John's time. Some of it is obviously in the future, the coming of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Absolutely. But most of what John is going to speak about in this book, as he said at the beginning of the book, is soon and near. Things happening then and now. Because this entire e book is covering the entire epoch of history, the last days between Christ's first and second time, uh, coming. What we saw uh, a couple of weeks ago is that the latter days of Daniel have become the sooner near of Revelation. The Daniel's visions which came with a command to seal it up are now being realized in Revelation with the command, do not seal it up. Because those last days have arrived. So the, the phrase, the things which shall take place after these things, describes not the peculiar experience of just some in the distant, far distant future from John's perspective. But rather they describe the universal experience of the whole church as we await the climatic arrival of Jesus Christ, the returning King. The kingdom of God is at hand, said Jesus. The rock uncut by human hands has broken into the world, and its rule is expanding as souls are saved, and opposition to its rival is pl plain to see in the tribulations that characterize every single century of the church. So let's be careful not to make verse 19 mean a little bit of the past, a little bit of the present, and the majority in the future. It doesn't. It means, very simply, write the things that you have seen. All the visions. The things that deal with the present and the future. Things that have begun to unfold and will t continue to unfold until he comes. That's what it means. And we must not let the scriptures, uh, beg your pardon, we must let the scriptures, not current affairs, be our guide in interpreting Revelation. If we approach chapters 4 to 19 with an overemphasis on the future, we will diminish our capacity to appreciate its relevance, its application now. Because instead of applying its ethical commands and warnings and seeing the encouragements we'll be trying to match tiny details of each vision to specific events we'll be making the locusts into cobra attack helicopters or making 666 into a supercomputer somewhere in belgium and we'll never be sure, and we'll always be shifting our interpretation, and we'll miss the whole point of the book. Instead of being ready and serving and being found doing what he commands when he comes back, we'll become skittish and unbalanced Christians reacting to every remote possible connection conjured up by overactive imaginations linking current affairs to strange things from this vision. What is the point of this book? It is not to plot the events of the future in graphic detail. No, it is written to warn and encourage the Church of Jesus Christ, partnered together in the tribulation, kingdom, and patient endurance throughout the last days until he comes. We are pilgrims on a journey. We are brothers on the road. We are here to help each other. Walk the mile and bear the load. I will weep when you are weeping. When you laugh, I'll laugh with you. I will share your joy and sorrow till we've seen this journey through. When we sing to God in heaven, we shall find such harmony 
born of all we've known together of Christ's love and agony. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we will need your strength and your spirit to be found faithful in this hostile world which militates against the Lord Jesus Christ and all of us who follow him and which throws its temptations in our path with all their alluring seductions. Please, will you make us strong in Christ even as we recognize our weakness in ourselves. And please, Father, Will you bind us together in greater unity and dependence as a church? We might be partnered together until your Son returns. For we ask this in the name of Father, Son and Spirit, to your honour and glory. Amen.